let's start by talking about the kinds of stage shows that that you do. You you have a very elaborate stage show with like special effects equipment and. Not really. No. No. Um, what happened was people get that idea because of Radio City. M music Hall, and what happens is when I was put in Radio City Music Hall, I tried to use everything that I could there, including the Rockettes, and uh, so it, it kind of looked, if, you, if that show was on TV a lot, and it looked like it was a very elaborate show, and that one was, but at uh, a place, for example, tonight at, uh, where I'm working at Valley Forge, which is just a theater in the round, there'll be absolutely nothing. You do wear pretty extravagant costumes, though, right? Um... Yeah, th not as much as I used to. Um, they're, they're designer clothes. I just have a lot of friends who, who are designers and they make me, or they're fans and they've made me uh, kind of one-of-a-kind things. How did you start incorporating that in, into your act? I had such a small audience that uh, they, the same audience would come back often, and so I had to keep, always think of something else to do rather than just be another singer-songwriter. So what I did was I'd just try and think of something else to do, which was how I started to get up away from the piano and shake maracas and tear my shirt off. And uh, it, it kind of built from there. What's, what are some of the more elaborate things that, that you've worn? That I've worn? In, yeah, um, in performance. Well, uh, I, I started off just wearing Hawaiian shirts a lot. And then a friend of mine was making clothes for Tina Turner. And he would like use the leftover things to make me t-shirts. So I'd wear those under the Hawaiian shirts. And so I used to tear off my Hawaiian shirts and I'd have these st strange, uh, torn, glittery t-shirts. And then I had a jacket once that was entirely covered in mirrors so that when I stood on top of the piano and was hit by the lights, it was like a mirror ball as I turned, which is kind of a nice effect. <laughs> That's great. Are there some audiences that that works for and others that prefer something more subdued? Um, no, I just, I just do it for all audiences, and then as I change, the act changes, too. I, I would never just think, okay, we're, we're at so-and-so, and now I've got, to, I've got to drag out the old mirror jacket or something like that. You grew up in Australia. Was there much of a, a music scene there when, when you were growing up? Uh, I was uh, involved with uh, a lot of the first wave of Australian pop, which was... Uh, Olivia, Helen Reddy, um, the Bee Gees, and people like that. Even Rick Springfield was very young, but he was still all in there. And uh, so we were all on a TV show called Bandstand, which, which nurtured us a little bit because we had to come up with a different song for every week. So you got a lot of it. Over a, a couple of year period, you had an awful lot of experience. Was Australian Bandstand based on American Bandstand? No, I think they just took the name. Um, there was, that had a stable of performers, and we just uh, kind of switched and did numbers together and, and started to get into a few dance routines and things just to make it more interesting because, again, we had to come up with something different all the time. Was um, American rock and roll a big influence on Australians? Very big at that point. Australia really didn't have a music industry of its own. Who epitomized, um, like, American rock when, when you were coming of age? Well, the thing about Australia is there was very little black music because um, there was no black population. So we didn't get a lot of black artists. We mainly got the white cover versions. Like Pat Boone? Like or? Pat Boone and um, the Everly Brothers, Neil Sedaka, that kind of thing. Um, when you started performing, you were performing with your brother? He was not my brother. Everyone thought we were, he oh. was, but it was just uh, another guy that uh, had been performing around the same places that I did, and he needed a partner. And so I said, okay. And when you were performing together, you were heard by Judy Garland? We were at that point in Hong Kong and uh, had worked the Orient for a couple of years. When um, she invited you to open for her, right? Yeah, and, and we did that for about two years. Were you exposed to the temper of hers that has been legendary, and I don't know if it's really true or not? Um, it, I, I can't quite remember all that much about the, the temper. I mean, she was very, uh, very uh, uh, moody as far as her moods, mood swings, but uh, mainly we got the, the artist on stage, and I had n never been a real fan or had, didn't know too much about her except you know, The Wizard of Oz and stuff like that. And it was really just fascinating, because I was 19, 20 years old, so it was fascinating just to watch uh, that kind of a performer. But I kind of thought that, that she epitomized the norm. So I had a bit of a distorted view. It wasn't until I started to see other artists and realized that not only were they not 
as temperamental as her, but they were also not as talented. It's it's funny, isn't it, when when you know somebody's like really super famous, but you don't know their work that well, and therefore you don't relate to them as the big star that many other people in the world see them as? The, well, growing up in the backwoods of Australia, you really have no idea who all these people are. And I was meeting Noel Coward and, uh, and Marlena Dietrich, and I had absolutely no idea what they did. You probably really, really wish you could meet him now. Now I wish I would. Now I'd be nervous. Then I wasn't nervous. I was real natural, and they thought it was sort of hilarious because I was just real natural with them because I wasn't impressed at all. I was falling asleep in front of Margot Fontaine and Nureyev and, and things like that. So um, now I'd be terrified to meet those people. Do you think that really helped you, being so blasé? Well, I was kind of blasé, uh, and, uh, mainly because I didn't know who they were. And, uh, yeah, I just uh, I didn't know the meaning of the word fear as far as uh, getting into places. I kind of expected, since everyone was so nice to me, I thought that's the way it was going to be all the time. I know that you were married for a while to Judy Garland's daughter, Liza Minnelli. Do you think that she had set you up in any way to meet each other? She set us up to meet each other, but um, you know, normally when you have a set-up situation, you recoil from it. But for, in this case, we found we, she was right. We did actually like each other very much. When you started your performing career in New York, what was the initial um, stage persona that you had? At that point, um, it was all... My, my influences were very much Randy Newman and Harry Nelson and Joni Mitchell type thing. So I, Laura Nero was a very big influence. So I was just sitting there alone at the piano singing depressing songs until I found that that was pretty depressing all around. So I, I needed to liven them up. So it turned into a, a thing where there was a strange juxtaposition of the very lively songs against very severe ballads. And I was kind of a, a strange, strange type. Were the lively songs your own? Yeah, most of the songs were my own. Although I used to do a lot of things that I'd done in show business earlier. So I'd sing um, s some kind of some strange old songs and um, put them in with uh, my new ballads. So it was a pretty eclectic act at the beginning. I think the uh, places that you first became really well known in New York were the Continental Baths and, and Reno Sweeney's. Is that fair Reno to say? Reno Sweeney. I, I only worked the baths twice. That was kind of after Bet had really put them on the map, and everyone kind of went and did one or two times. But she, the Continental Baths were really hers, and Reno Sweeney was kind of I was the guy at Reno Sweeney. What was the atmosphere like in that club? It was wonderful because it was the first cabaret type club, and it uh, drew and it was situated on on the edge of the village and yet close enough for uptown so that you got uh, a lot of people in jeans coming in and a lot of people in black tie coming down so it was a really mixed audience in every way and so you could literally get away with anything in that club you didn't have to be like anyone else and the more unlike anyone else you were the better it was what are some of the things you think it gave you the liberty to get away with well it gave me it it, it let me create the person that i was on stage which was um, pretty strange because I could just do anything there, and I used to do the most uh, strange, strange concerts. I would, I would, I would do medleys of um, Scott Joplin piece interspersed with "Most Gentlemen Don't Like Love" and, and uh, obscure Cole Porter songs, and and I could. Uh, I, I, it was fabulous. I had a black guitar player, Tiger Haynes, who's an old jazz guitar player, and he would come in, and we'd do songs that I remembered from when I was a kid and at the same time I was writing a lot and so I was putting in very new ballads but it was lots of real obscure songs. What would your admirers who'd come to see you frequently uh, do? Would they buy you drinks uh, or send, send anything up to you at uh, Oh, I had a really stage? extravagant group. Um, oh, there, were, they were, there was a couple of... Uh, a lady who owned a florist and she would send over... A, she would ask me what I wanted the club to look like and uh, whatever I wanted. And the next night, the club would be full of cut amaryllis, which were, you know, about four bucks a piece, and she would send a hundred down. So it was funny like that. Would it be awkward for you about how to, like, uh, return the favor for people who would give you no, gifts everyone, like that? No, it everyone, it, it, it was still uh, the er very early 70s, and there was still that leftover sense of freedom from the 60s that you could get away with anything. 
Did you start dressing during those concerts at Reno Sweeties? Yeah, but sometimes I'd wear tails and sometimes I'd wore, I wore Hawaiian shirts. And, and kids in the village would make me clothes and say, do you want to try out this? So it was a funny mix. How important is um, a manager in figuring out like what kind of venues you want to play in and what kind of image you want to present? How, how much of that takes a, a good manager to, to execute, to help execute the ideas that you have in, in a career? Well, what was strange was uh, no one quite knew what to do with me in show business as far as people in, in, in the business. They didn't quite know who my appeal was. And I was very lucky because D. Anthony was managing, um, he had had Emerson, Lake and Palmer, Joe Cocker, and at that point had um, Peter Frampton. And he was considered the, the hot agent, um, the hot manager in America at that point, because that was the year of Frampton was so huge, Frampton Comes Alive. And he took a look at me down at the bottom line, which was a rock club. St there was still a pretty big rock club. And um, saw that I'd sold out there for four nights, and he said, well, obviously, it's not a limited appeal here. So he took me and put me in Central Park in the Concerts in the Park series. And we drew 10,000 people, and I thought I'd, my audience was at around about 300, so... Um, th it was very good that that I got the okay from someone who people in show business respected, so they didn't say, "Well, we have no idea what who he appeals to." So I guess the confusion with you is that it's it's part pop, part uh, part musical. It was musicals, part a lot of part, things, yeah. and I didn't act like any other man on stage because um, at that point there were still pretty much stereotypes. You were either a rock and roll singer like Mick Jagger, or you were an Italian singer in a tuxedo. <laughs> and there wasn't really an in-between. So I was singing a lot of different kind of songs, and I didn't look like anyone else. I didn't act on stage like anyone else. You know, I have, My reviews from those days are really hysterical because they're always, he's part this, part that. So it was, you know, part Errol Flynn, part Carmen Miranda, part uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, uh, part Noel Cat. I mean, it's just the, the oddest combinations because people just didn't know what to call me. What about now? Do you think that... Well, uh, now everyone's used to me, you know, and I'm on Disneyland specials and things like that, so I'm, I've somehow I've become okay. And also with people like Boy George around, I look pretty tame. As I said, I'm in Bedminton and I look like a nice suburban couple alongside <laughs> the, um, the ones that are up now. Did you get to know her well when she was working the Continental Baths and you were doing Reno Sweeney's? Afterwards, we got to... We both opened in Los Angeles on the same show. It was our, both our first times in Los Angeles in about 1972. Do, do you think you share a lot in common musically? Musically, I think the great thing that Bette did was to take away the barriers. No one used to sing 40s or 30s or 50s songs before that. Or if they did, that's all they sang. She, she was the first one to use to, to sing any, any, any decade songs and put them all together into an act that worked. I'm talking with uh, singer-songwriter and performer Peter Allen, who's in Philadelphia to perform at the Valley Forge Music Fair. Now, you're also known for the songs that you've written, which um, you perform in, in your act and have recorded, but have also been recorded uh, by other people as well. You, you, there's been several hit records, uh, several number one recordings, actually, I think. Um, I guess the first big score that someone else had with one of your songs was um, Olivia Newton-John's I, I Honestly Love You. Yeah, that's my first hit. Uh, did you know her from Australia? She was, a, she was on bandstand in Australia, but she was a real little kid then. You know? She was a very young girl. And I, I, cause I left Australia when I was 18, so I only got to know her when I went back occasionally. Um, what was it like for you to hear someone else interpreting your song on record? I, th I thought she was making like a very big mistake by putting it out as a single. I thought it was really pretty, but I thought there's no way that it would ever be a hit because it didn't have a drum, and she was known for country and western songs at that point. And I thought it was a nice song, but I had no idea that it was a hit song. That actually really helped establish her career, don't you think? Well, yeah. It's, it's nice to go out and be able to sing a lot of songs that people know. And it, in the business, it gave me some kind of credence as a songwriter. Um, do, how, how much of what you do do you consider to be your songwriting? Like, do you think of yourself as primarily a songwriter or, or a, a performer? Well, I'm, when I'm performing, I'm singing my songs that I've written. And the other thing is, is that a song lasts quite a long time, but a performance is just that. When, when the performance is over, it's over. You get a lot more satisfaction out of writing a song that stays around for a couple of years. One of your songs is called By Coastal, and uh, I think you've been credited with coming up with, with the term. 
Oh, well, I said it as a joke for, for a long time, and because uh, uh, I think I, it was in Australia, someone asked me where in America that was the center of show business. Did it because it used to be New York, and then it moved to Los Angeles, and it says in moving back to New York, I said, "Oh, everyone in show business is bicoastal." Flippantly, and um, people laughed, and so I started to, to say it in the act, and then the next thing I knew, people were saying that they were bicoastals, and they were naming bicoastals on the front of New York Magazine and all this stuff. And I'd kind of said it as a joke, but then I wrote the song and named the album that. Um, you had you alluded this to this earlier. Your performances at uh, Radio City Music Hall with the Rockettes. How how um, were you choreographed in into that? Well, I was asked. I was looking for a place in New York to play that was the right size because there's not a lot of places in New York to, that, are, that are a good size. And Radio City had been just saved and wasn't going to be torn down, but they didn't quite know what to do with it. And I'd seen a couple of concerts there. But you know, I always felt a slight disappointment when I'd go to Radio City because you really go to Radio City and you do want to see the Rockettes and you want to see the stage go up and down and all the things that the theater's capable of. So I, there, was, there was a sense of something missing when I'd just go out there and someone would walk out on stage and sing and that was it. You, you felt that something was missing from Radio City. So I said if I ever played Radio City, I'd really want to see if I could use the Rockettes and all that. And m kind of as a joke, but my manager went to them and asked them, and they said, sure, he can actually have the Rockettes because they're not working for the couple of days that he's here. So once I had the permission, I just thought, well, let's just dive right in and do it. So what, what did you do together? Um, well, I got in a choreographer, a friend of mine, and he uh, did, did uh, a couple of numbers. We did everything old as new again. I decided that what everyone in the audience really is sitting there wanting to do every time they go to Radio City is to get up and do high kicks with the Rockettes. So I got up and did high kicks with the Rockettes and we used the stages to go up and down and up and I came down from the ceiling and I went down into the pit and all this stuff. So it was kind of interesting because I was the first one who'd been allowed to really use it all. Did you have to align your kick with their kick? Did you try to be precision with them? Oh, I worked very hard on the dancing. I didn't want to look like a klutz in, in the middle of it all. So what did you learn about um, precision choreography well, I hadn't working done, with them? I'd just really uh, moved around a lot on stage. I'd never really been choreographed that much. And uh, I realized how hard it is to dance, to learn to dance. And the problem was that once everyone saw me doing that, they automatically figured that I was a dancer. So then they called me for the Oscars, and I got there, and I found it was a 10-minute tap dance number. And uh, the man said, okay, we'll start off with a time step. And I said, what's a time step? And their jaws dropped open and they said, you mean you've been signed to do this lead in the tap number and you can't tap dance? I said, well, I'm sure I can learn, you know. So I learned <laughs> in two weeks for the Oscars. And they... That was the Irving Berlin medley? Yeah. So it's, uh, now I've just, at, at, in my late 30s, they decided I was a dancer. Do you do more of it now? In the act I do it, but I, I can only do exactly what I've learned for those particular things. I can't. <laughs> and more and more they're putting me in production numbers and they automatically expect me to dance so now I've learned to dance. Who do you think of your audience as being now? It's impossible to to put any kind of a, uh, a thing on my audience. I mean it's definitely there's a huge majority that are in their 30s uh, and 40s um, but there's no like you, you can't pin put a like a Barry Manilow audience has a certain time, and a Bruce Springsteen are all 23 and white. And, but I just cannot figure out who comes to my concerts. Who do you listen to when you're not uh, performing? Um, I don't listen to much music. It's like... It's, it's I like work. So, yeah, it's, it's so hard. Uh, it's, it's, it's not enjoyable, but I love lots of music. I, I'd, I'd probably put on Brazilian music to relax by, I think is the most relaxing for me that I like to listen to and, and still doesn't... Uh, it's not like putting on Muzak or anything like that. Um, I, I, I still kind of like a lot of my old influences. Who are? I think Randy Newman is one of the great American musicians, and also his humor was incredible. And, I was, and it's very funny because uh, I, he was r really the one that I thought was the great American talent. And uh, I read an interview once, and he, th he thought that I Honestly Love You was the worst song ever written, which I loved, <laughs> saying <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Um, do you think that show business is an especially manic, depressive type um, uh, business to be in? Because you can get so high when you're on the stage, and then you're in a strange city afterwards. And There's all that. I think trying to fit in with what show business tells you you're supposed to be is awfully difficult. I see so many unhappy um, people who had very big hits at one point and then uh, the style changes and all of a sudden they're running out to buy drum machines and trying to write a new wave which is not what they do and I think to try and always keep up with what's current in show business and to, and to do that uh, LA success thing that that could drive you crazy but I just have always just kind of plowed ahead doing exactly what I what I wanted as far as and, and lucky if, if one of them fit in but I, I I can't really uh, go around and hustle myself too much. I'm really lucky that the audience came to me after a long time. Have there been uh, producers or record companies that have tried to package you as a person that you didn't think you were? Mm, I've been lucky. I was with A&M for a long time, and they almost let me do what I wanted on A&M. Um, and now I'm an arister, and Clive Davis is a much more directional because he's guided Barry Manilow and Melissa Manchester to a lot of big hits. So I will actually listen to him, and uh, we kind of strike a deal. I'll do a couple of the ones he likes if he lets me do most of the ones that I like. And uh, he's been good. So he let me do a live Carnegie Hall. The one thing I asked him for is to let me record Carnegie Hall. Um, and so that's, that's a new live album that's coming out because I really wanted to get down the stage show as it was. I figured it was in really good shape at that point, and I knew that Carnegie Hall would be exciting because I hadn't played in New York in a concert situation for a long time. So uh, when, you, when you start doing Radio City a lot and things like that, people forget that you were basically a songwriter entertainer. So I went back to New York and just did, I, I really parred the act down so it didn't become kind of like a Liberace circus. And um, I tried to do that with it. So now it's basically a very, uh, it's much tighter. And I'm trying to retain the energy that a big spectacle <laughs> gives you without uh, having to drag on a lot of props. You know, you said before about performers um, never really knowing when the style's going to change and then have to get on the drum machine and uh -huh. and all that. Have you gone through periods like that where where suddenly what you were doing is like considered out of style and you have to figure out what I'm you're going to do? In, uh, well, I've never I've never really hit it so enormously big. I've ne for example, I've never had like a, a a number one record of my own. I've never had. Um, a, a, a TV series or something that I've got that I've got to live up to. So I'm kind of always interested enough to uh, see what's going on. I've never made it enough that people want to want to beat me down, particularly. So I just I'm always saying yes to everything new, and rather than just say, well, I couldn't possibly do that. I think, hey, well, let's try it and see if it works out. Okay. Well, I want to thank you very much for talking with oh, us. Oh, thanks a lot.